This is actually I presented at the principal conference last week, and it turns out that September 28, 1998 was the first day that the Google search was actually available. And so I kind of bring that up because that changed thing we just talked about. Um, only 20 years has Google been around as a search engine. And it kind of just puts it in context about how many things have changed in terms of how we do things in our schools and in society as a whole. I kind of thought that was an interesting sort of thing to start off with. So, not, um, not only that, it's a great date because September 28th is my birthday. Oh, wow. <laughs> Happy belated birthday. Did you get yeah. I'm sure they did. Awesome. So, what we really want to use Google Classroom for, and this goes for D2L as well, is so we're trying to improve our instructional program. And so if we do that, we want to have some key focuses that we draw on some from ministry documents and those sorts of things. We want to make sure we can differentiate for student learning because we've got diverse learners in every single classroom on the face of the planet has, has mm -hmm. different needs. Um, we want students to be able to create content, not just consume it. Uh, we want to be able to collaborate with students and therefore give feedback. And a term will better be easy. And if it's not easy, people just are not going to use it. So within our board, we're starting to notice kindergarten grade one teachers actually using Google Classroom in their classrooms. And I think that's probably, probably the best indication that this is ridiculously easy to use. Mm -hmm. The startup basically goes from zero to, within about two minutes you can have a full classroom up and running and have your students join it and kind of go from there. And I think from my experience with D2L, well, that's one of the barriers towards it. It's not necessarily easy. Google Classroom is ridiculously easy. And like I said, if I've got a kindergarten teacher using kindergarten students, that kind of speaks to how they've done it as a whole. So mm -hmm. when I work with teachers, I tend to kind of I tend to work with them in hour sessions. Ideally, it doesn't always work out that way. But what we do is we create content in Google Drive, and so for that hour long time period, I'll work for about fifty five minutes in this particular spot, trying to basically make sure we can create content with clear learning objectives, clear success criteria. We embed the feedback into that Google Doc or that Google Slide as well, too. I'll give you some examples of what it might look like coming up. And then the last two to three minutes, we just post it in Google Classroom. And we use Google Classroom as a way to distribute what we've already done in Drive. So a lot of people say, hey, I need an hour to set up Google Classroom. Actually, you need about 55 minutes to create a meaningful activity that's well structured in Google Drive. And then we need about two minutes in Google Classroom to blast it right there. Okay, so that's that's kind of the workflow that we kind of take a look at as a whole. Um, and actually, this is this is a big piece of the puzzle too. You can have multiple teachers collaborating in the same classroom, and that's a relatively new feature. So you can have, for example, your spec ed department as co-teachers within that classroom, which will allow them to have teaching privileges that allow for easier differentiation. Uh, it allow for a whole bunch of things as well too to go on. I've been working. I've been at schools where I'm working with the spec ed department and uh, they have teach students come in for extra help in a resource room sort of environment. And what happens is the students walk down and the teacher says, well, hey, how can I help you? And the student goes, I don't know, I forgot what I was doing. And it, that's an issue that can be solved with Google Classroom. Sort of is actually part of that Google Classroom. So they can pull up and see exactly what the activity is, make modifications on the fly and kind of meet those pedagogical issues that we're taking a look at as well too. Um, allows for team teaching really easily as well too, and you can share resources really, really easily. Right now Google Classroom is, isn't set up to share outside of the board. I originally wanted to kind of invite you to a Google Classroom from my WRDSP account. That doesn't work that way, but anybody in your board, you can collaborate with as well. So uh, Allison, who's another digital literacy support teacher, the two of us are kind of planning, trying to explore a little bit about how we can create a master class between teachers at multiple different schools and use that as a resource sharing sort of platform. Okay. So we're kind of, that's in its early stages. I think it's an intriguing sort of option. Ask me again in a year how it's going. Uh, but for right now, that's what we're kind of exploring. Yeah, I think that's, that's really interesting. I mean, the, the power of this, um, besides teaching, is obviously, um, you know, leveraging the sharing of knowledge and best practices. and. Um, promoting really that reflective practice. Um, I just wanted to mention uh, the acronyms that are on, on the page here. We have um, yeah. CERT is Special Education Resource mm -hmm. Teacher, uh, ELL, English Language Learner, and then we have Learning Support Teachers and Digital Literacy Support Teachers. 
Um, I'm not sure if you picked up on this, but we love our acronyms. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Absolutely. We can never have too many acronyms, so yes, that, that's a good catch at least. It's different boards use different things. My sister's a teacher in New York region, and we kind of get confused with each other very regularly because their board uses different acronyms for the same thing. So what are you talking about? So, anyway, that's okay. <laughs> that's, um, a, that's education, though, isn't it? Yeah, that's education. Yeah. If you're not careful, you can talk in acronyms for an hour and forget what you're actually talking about. <laughs> so, that's pretty much it for the presentation. I just want to show you a sample class now about how I've organized it in the past, and we can kind of maybe kind of walk you through some of the steps as well, too. So. This is a sample class that I've created. Um, you'll notice at the very top, there are three different tabs at the very top, basically stream, classwork, and people. Um, stream is designed to make announcements, and if you post something in classroom, it will actually, classwork rather, it will show up on stream as well too. So this is kind of the, the flash screen that when a student enters into the Google Classroom, they will see exactly what's going on. So you can see that I've just added some added some activities in preparation for this particular chat in this Google Classroom, and so that's how that works. If I click on Classwork, this is how the work is actually organized. So the Create button, Google is really trying to streamline and make the Create button basically be similar across all of their different tools. Um, so you'll notice that Google Classroom looks like this, the Create button, Gmail, has a very similar sort of thing. Google Drive will have the same sort of thing as well, too. So it's kind of universal across all of their platforms, depending on what to look for. Uh, you also have the people aspect of this as well, too. I only have one student, and that's my son. Uh, he gets to be my guinea pig on these things as well, too. To get students to enter into the classroom at this particular page, all you have to do is click on Settings. And each classroom you create will have its own unique code. So student, students will have to enter that code the first time and they'll never have to enter it again. So when you're kind of mentioning about how D2L is like I can enter as a student but not as a teacher, all that, all that stuff is just done. We're, this, this, the, the setup literally will take, once you create a class, to post, post this in a classroom and have students enter the Google Classroom, probably will take you probably about five minutes in total and you can have the class up and running. So, is that okay? Did, did, have any questions so far? No, it's good. Okay. So, <clears throat> what I want to talk, kind of talk to you about, and we'll give you some hands-on things as well too, is the classwork option. And, you know, this is that, again, that workflow is, these are items that I've created in Google Drive, and I've shared with the students in Google Classroom. So in the career section here, this is actually a Google Doc that I've created inside of Google Google Drive. And you'll see basically from my screen, you can see that I've set it up that each student will get a copy. So if I have one student, for example, my son, if I, when I sign this, he will get his own copy with his name on it, and that basically works. If there's 50 students, all 50 of them will get their own unique copy. So it turns into a digital photocopier very easily and readily on that. So you, term, have, you only have to work off of the one master then and it does the distribution? Yeah. Yeah, it does. You click a button and it automatically distributes it. Whether you have one one student like this class or you have 50, it will automatically create, create those copies. And so I think it's worthwhile to take a look at the actual Google Doc that I've created because I've learned some things along the way that actually help with good pedagogy that help us to basically um, help the students understand how they're getting assessed. Mm -hmm. Give us a, a leg up to give timely and descriptive feedback as well too. So the first thing I did in this Google Doc is basically I put the rubric. And because Google Classroom will make a copy for every single student, every single student will automatically have access to, to the rubric. Right. In a perfect world, which we struggle with down here as well, students will use this rubric to guide their work. That takes a fair amount of hand holding still at even the high school level, I'm sure. That's kind of what we are striving for. So you can see basically this is the rubric, and uh, I kind of go from there. And then the activity is basically looking, looking like this. Um, it's a fairly basic and simple activity. I have an article link to a specific article based on this, so when students click on this, it goes directly to the article that I want them to read. This was out of a careers course I talked about years ago, and what they uh, were talking about is future job trends, and so we take a look at the driver of this vehicle, to what impact is that going to have? Future, future drivers. Um, and so 
this is the article I would want them to read. Once they read the article, they're going to summarize the two different opposing, opposing views and then their own opinion based on evidence from the article. That so that did take me an hour once you get onto the process of creating a Google Doc with those key aspects of the success criteria, the rubrics, and those sorts of things. It kind of can fly by within that. And then in class in the classroom that I created an assignment and I set it up to make every single student get caught. So that was the purpose, oops, that was the purpose for that particular activity. And each activity you post in Google Classroom, you will ask the exact same questions. What's my purpose? What do I want this to actually be? And I think anytime that I've had disaster lessons in the classroom, which are many, I fail to ask that question, say, what exactly am I trying to accomplish? And taking that extra little bit of time to do that really helps everyone. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yes. And I, I, I have to continually learn that as well. <laughs> I learned that yesterday. <laughs> mm -hmm. Especially when you're teaching language, because I find my students, they are not language based. They're, they're learning their language from the word get go. And we thought if they heard it, so that they could articulate the vowel sounds, so let's get Gene to read it. Reading it two minutes into the reading. And Amy thought maybe 10 minutes. 10 minutes of reading, just listening to the language. I, I, by, by two minutes in, I realized these guys aren't listening. Because they haven't understood anything from the word get go. So it would be like a Japanese fellow walking in here and saying, I want to talk to you for 10 minutes and I want you to listen. Within no time at all, I'd be doing it. Like, that so strategy good. didn't work. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so so, anyway, so this particular article would be, a, would be a bit of a solution if I understood the challenge well. Like, and, and this is you know, a perfect example because this is actually a podcast as well, too, so all the text is actually transformed from that. Like, no, and that's just dumb luck that this particular article does that, but at the same time, there are options out there basically have that help them understand what's going on as well. I really um, like that it includes that, that option, and I, I remember um, looking at some examples with Allison when she was doing one of the paper -like workshops, and just the fact that it's there recognizes that some people learn orally, some like to see the print, some like both, some need a video. There's all different kinds of learning styles that um, you know, can be accounted for and addressed with um, these different approaches. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think the other point that I want to make as well, that if we have that as a lens, which is a really great, important lens to respect the diversity of every single classroom I've ever been in in my life, that it ought to be really, if, if we can make the differentiation easy to do, that means we're just going to do it more often. And so, you know, I, I reflect back on my time in a grade eight classroom where I tried to find, I found a, a, a newspaper article that I really liked <clears throat> um, that was relevant to the purpose of what we were trying to accomplish the topics we were exploring. I'd have to make three different copies of it, and I would basically copy it in Microsoft Word and basically modify the text to make sure that I, I had three different levels of the exact same text so everybody in the class was reading it, and it's like, that's the right thing to do, but I still need to sleep between two and three in the morning. It was really hard to do that more than a handful of times. I'd love to tell you that I did more often, but I really didn't. Uh, just because it was so difficult and so time consuming. So recognizing that that's a challenge, we can actually leverage the digital tools to kind of respect that diversity and hopefully make it a little bit easier. And if we make it easier for the students to access the information, then that can transform the learning environment as well. Mm -hmm. Still not it's still not like super duper easy, but it's a lot easier than it was with the Microsoft Word example mm -hmm. as well too. So that's one example. Are you, that okay? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So that's one example of how I've set up a classroom basically in terms of an assignment. Um, I've done, you know, I've created a Google Doc, made a copy for every student. It does it automatically. Life is okay within that. Um, if I want to see the work, it's automatically into this environment where I can actually click on Kevin's assignment and then I go right here. So all of this happens automatically, which is that easy part. Um, as few clicks as possible to get to that point. This is actually his assignment. If he had actually done any work on it, I could basically provide 
I can take a look, I can add comments, I can do suggestions. Uh, the same comment base basically works like this, so I can actually add a comment. Um, You know, you get the idea you want to be more descriptive than that, but that's basically how that idea works. Um, and then you can scroll through your students up here as well, too. So that whole sharing and collaboration, like I showed you on that third slide, really is key in that aspect. And if it's easy to do that, then you're going to do it more often. So that's how, if you make a copy for every single student, that's how that's going to look. Kind of So the other example that I want to show you, and I will give you some time to kind of mess around a little bit. Uh, so most of the time, if teachers are kind of just new to Google Classroom, I suggest you can go to this, this area right here to start off with. This is like, if you just kind of get used to that part of creating a Google Doc, having a link to an online article, doing a simple activity, embedding the rubric, and kind of getting used to providing feedback digitally, that's a really great start for like the first three months of you trying to move classroom. Like that's, if you could just swim in that pool to start off with, that's what I normally coach people through. Because that's a huge return on your investment. That's a great pedagogy that you're amplifying. All of the good stuff is going on. But there's some other things that are, that are kind of intriguing as well too. And this is an example of what I did in one of my civics classes as well. Is that instead of having a student get, every, get a copy, every single student get a copy, what I did is I made, a, I made this Google slide deck and I gave everybody editing per permission. This creates a jigsaw activity. <clears throat> so if I click on the article, this is going to see, this is what your students are going to see as well too. And this key aspect that I actually chose to give students editing privileges. And so each of these slides here are created by two different students. And we did that whole part of that we did that whole aspect of behind the scenes, so they all knew exactly. So Joe and Bob did slide number three, Susie and Jill did slide number four. I kind of assigned that part. And what goes on in the classroom at that point, if you give them editing privileges, Google Slides works perfectly for this. You can compartmentalize what is, who's doing what. And then that kind of amplifies the collaboration, which is a key, one of the key global competency that we're trying to add into our classrooms all the time. It basically helps the students to, to share resources as well too, um, and kind of go from there. So that's this is kind of a jigsaw activity in the middle of the class. What happens is basically you have this open, and you can see all the students working on this particular Google Google slide at exactly the same time and sharing and collaborating their work as well too, which is a pretty powerful sort of example of how you can actually do a meaningful jigsaw activity and still have students have access to other people's work and uh, kind of. So the last thing I'm going to show you before we do some hands-on things is basically how you create an assignment. And this is basically the work you do. You click on create, go to assignment. You must put a title in. And then you have lots of different options to this part. Um, most of the time I suggest the instructions are actually embedded into either Google Doc or the Google Slides. Those are the primary two, two, two tools in Google Drive that we actually use to distribute content to students. Um, so I would recommend you have that. The point system, depending on your assessment philosophy as a whole, um, that's the only thing I'm not really a big fan of in Google Classroom. I would love for them to have embedded a rubric into this, and we're going to work on that as well, too. But we can kind of MacGyver it to a certain extent by adding the rubric at the top of the uh, Google Doc or the Google Slides that we actually do. You can send that new data if you want to. You can add topics to it as well, too, as a way to organize. And you see these bottom buttons here. Mm -hmm. You click on Google Drive, that's what I recommend. But you can also insert YouTube videos as well, too, that I can pick on assignment, go from there, and then see how students can view file. If I just click on this down arrow, that gives me the options. I would love for Google Classroom to have make a copy for every student be the first choice, but it's not. So one of the most common errors that I do regularly is I just click, hey, I'm good to go. And then I realize that I forgot to click on make a copy for your student. One of the glitches within Google Classroom that's easy enough to overcome is that if you edit it, you only have options to edit. So if you edit the assignment, 
you only have options to, to view file or students can edit file. Because you've spent 55 minutes or so basically creating that Google Doc or that Google Slide and using the last two minutes to basically use Google Classroom as a distribution model, what I recommend, it sounds scary, is deleting the assignment in Google Classroom because you've still got to ruin your drive and just starting again. It's a little bit, it's a little bit wonky work around, but it's the easiest thing to do. I've done that so many times, I've been it. But uh, that's basically the best process. So you click on that, you click on assign. This little down arrow here as well too allows you to save, save the draft if you'd like to, so you can actually create assignments and have them shared. Um, a couple of years ago, the first year that I was, I am trained and had actually all my experience in the classroom was grade eight class, or yeah, kidding, or actually grade four to grade eight classrooms for the first 15 years of my teaching career before this game. And a couple of years back, I had a chance to teach grade 10 civics and careers. And, but I had them, it was a summer school course and I had them for six hours a day. So I didn't really, wasn't really, I was kind of feeling out the content that I had to teach. I was feeling out how, how to basically go about doing the assessments. I didn't know how fast grade tens would work because I had no reference point for it. Mm -hmm. I did a lot of activities where I saved the draft for it and it was a real anxiety reducer for me because I had everything set up in my back pocket, ready to go. So if you save, a, save as a draft, you can see that basically it just shows up right here. You see that students don't. So if you want to do some preamble, get ahead of yourself a little bit, um, and kind of do some planning for future activities as well, so you can always do that part. So once you get into your classroom, all you have to do is this part, you click on settings. Here's the new code for this. So students would have to sign into their Google accounts access Google Classroom as well too, and then and then type, add this, add this code in. When students sign up to Classroom, they only see, so as teachers, we're gonna see create and join. Students should only see join class, so they don't have an option to create, they just can just only join, and once you have that set up, then, it's, then that code, then basically they just type that code in, they click on join class and say, ask your teacher for the class code, and enter here. Simple as that. Yeah. What a great feature. It's awesome. Um, and, and because I'm supporting K and, K and 8 within my gig, grade 1 tends to be the time that I kind of have a little bit of wishy-washy. You can actually add students' emails into this to invite them. For grade 1, it's a kindergarten student, that's a cool. Grade 2 and up, so high school is not a problem at all. You just go through that. So that slide here that they see right there, that really is the workflow that I recommend for people to use. That you basically, and, and to start off with, like the bite-sized piece, you can kind of get used to making an assignment, creating an assignment in Google Drive, using Classroom as a way to distribute it, and basically just hang out there for like the next, for the rest of the first semester. Are you semester? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so yeah, like, just hang out there. One of the, one of the traps that I've seen teachers go through is they try to do everything at once and then we end up burning ourselves out and get frustrated as well too. So there's huge return on that from a pedagogical standpoint that if you take the time to basically organize and create, create content in Google Drive and use Classroom as a way to distribute it, if you just do that for the next three months, uh, that really goes a long way to kind of understanding how Google Classroom works and get really good at that aspect of it. The rest of it is really, really cool, but those are nice add-ons to use from you as a teacher knowing when to use those extra tools as well too that really can, can do some I pretty collaboration things in the classroom. Mm -hmm. I think it's all about getting organized, like he says. Oh yeah, the organization is key and there's some nice workflow in here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I found myself that my, my own practice sort of started to change the more times that I did digital, con digital content. I was pretty brutal with the binder part, but I was pretty decent as it turns out with the digital part because I could make changes on the fly when I have a typo. <laughs> like yes, or, or totally. Even, you know, I, I know this happens to all good teachers where you kind of you realize about halfway through the lesson you missed the step or missed an instructional piece and the whole thing fell apart. Mm -hmm. For me, it was super easy digitally to say I need to add this extra part to scaffold this lesson, this information properly. I can add it in real time. Suddenly, the next year, if I'm lucky enough to have the same teaching assignment, 
then I've already got the corrected, updated, improved version of that particular original activity, and that just made my my classroom practice evolve dramatically because of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I guess too, you have the option depending on the the content and the approach you're taking, but you know, you, a teacher might develop a you know a set of templates that have some of these core instructions in there. And then you're just tailoring the assignment as opposed to creating Creating a new assignment all the time. Yeah, yeah. But once you get onto that workflow, like this life actually becomes a little bit easier to buy more time to get back to Yeah, you're not staying up all night creating lesson plans. That's what we're trying to do. Right. Yeah. So that that's you know, to start off with, that's a pretty I think that's a pretty good start for posture and really its advantages and it's so easy to use. Um, to create a class, you don't need to have, you know, district approval or anything. There's no hoops to go through. You basically go into classroom, click on plus, and create a class, share the code, and you're off to the races. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I still remember when we got our very first version of Google Classroom. It was released that year at uh, our summer Katsu uh, camp, and the enthusiasm, how easy people were able to na navigate through even you know, that point in time it was amazing. Yeah, and it's it's just gotten better. I mean, like I share with everybody now that we have grade one kindergarten grade one students that are using Google Classroom in their classroom. It's for really meaningful things, deliberate purposes, and it's uh it's pretty amazing to watch. But that's a pretty good litmus test. If I if we need the technology to be ridiculously easy and simple to use, that's if they can do it, then we're all Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jeff, would you have any comment on uh, the parental access piece? Google has had some glitches as of late, so I'm going to preface everything like that. I think the contents, um, I'll go back to screen share and I'll show you what it looks like. If you go into, you can add individual parent guardians to each individual student. So e e email. So this would be this would be my own personal home, home email as dad. So basically how it works is this. Um, once once parents accept permission, accept the invite to receive weekly updates from from the Google Classroom, they will receive once once a week an email that looks something like this. You don't have to, the teachers don't have to lift a single finger on this. This will automatically be generated with everything. So, in terms of keeping parents in the loop, that's a pretty powerful tool as a well. whole. Um, so this, this will be a sample of what email would actually look like that, that parents would actually get to. Um, in the elementary schools, we're kind of straying away from the paper planner, but we don't really have a substitute in terms of how the teachers communicate with, with parents and like may be transparent with the learning in the classroom. So um, a lot of teachers are starting to experiment with this as a way to kind of have a replacement of keeping that communication kind of open and consistent. And because it generates itself automatically, um, when you go, it's super easy. Um, if it's easy, that's going to just happen on its own too. The only workflow that you have to do is you do have to go through the game of entering each individual Right. So that that's a bit of a drag, but the benefits of it are pretty profound. So two questions here. Um, one, can you customize that message? In other words, you know, might you be able to say for this week, add on a reminder about the field trip next Wednesday kind of thing, or is this, you know, sort of out of the box, just one option? Yeah, this is out of the box, so it's customized responses. But again, it will cust it will only it will only produce an email of things that you actually post in the classroom. So if you want to customize that part, then basically you can just actually add the announcement on the screen, and it would actually show up. So okay. then you get some clues. Okay, well, that's, that's exactly what I was wondering, but you just answered it. Yeah, so that's so good. Whatever I'm working on on my computer, via history or whatever. They will customize the response engineered by what's in my computer. 
right? As long as you post it onto the As long as I post it into the classroom. So, and if you post four assignments uh -huh. and a reminder, then five things will be included in this weekly summary. Right. Mm, yeah. Cool. And so this, this example here, Felix, the example for Felix you can see on the screen here, he's obviously involved with the US Ed Classroom, the Google Classroom for US History and English mm -hmm. American Literature is, and Marine Biology apparently. So uh, that will kind of outline that information. So Google Classroom will actually pull all the classes that Felix is involved with and mm -hmm. post it in this one particular email. Right. And like I said, the great thing about this process is you, you don't have to lift a finger. Exactly, that's what I like about it. <laughs> yeah. It's a nice automated feature. I want to be in the Google Classroom. The other uh, uh, point I was going to touch on here, Jeff, was um, the idea of um, student privacy and, and matching them up with uh, their parent guardian emails. Yeah. Our, our, our board's currently using uh, some kind of a sign-off from you know, something that goes home and yeah. the parent signs it. And so I'm just thinking about custodial rights and some of the things that um, could take a, a tool like this but you know, maybe kind of cause a problem for some students. Yeah, you're right. So, so one of the lenses that we look at for this, and it would be great to have this automated through our central board schools here. It's going to be a suggestion that we make sometime in the next couple of weeks. But we do have to be very much aware of uh, custodial rights and whether or not it's actually legal for this for a particular guardian to receive information mm -hmm. from the school. And that's not many, but it does. Have, it is out there. It's an important question to actually ask for you with the emails and so um, that's the I suspect the one big trend when we're dealing with digital literacy as a whole is going to be that privacy piece is going to become a bigger and bigger part of the discussion as we move forward. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that was a really important question. It's a really important thing to be aware of. Well listen, thank you so much for um, dialing in a little time to help us out here today. Mm -hmm. Greatly appreciate it and um, I'll look forward to an upcoming breakfast meeting with you. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay. It was nice to meet you. Okay. All right. See you. Thanks. So that's what he was talking about. Because I, I didn't find the waffle. That's not a problem. But I couldn't sign in.